lifted. So, uh, as I said before, uh, well, I'm still 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 as well as the European uh, Institute, as the European Institute, as an institution, AECO, worldwide perspective in Europe, which is uh, another institution that uh, is sponsoring these other events that uh, are taking place throughout the year. So, the uh, Grand, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing correctly your name, the Grand, the Grand. So, these are, uh, as I said, uh, our um, presenter, he probably doesn't need a presentation. Uh, uh, for most of you, he's a visiting uh, uh, researcher at uh, the European Institute. He studied at the LSE. Uh, he was an uh, uh, economics uh, graduate from the school, uh, graduated as well in, in, a, in a master's in, in uh, the politics of, of uh, the global, the global uh, um, uh, world, uh, as far as I understood. And uh, he uh, has a distinguished uh, career. Um, Basically, as a writer, as a journalist, he's uh, been working for the FT, uh, the Guardian, uh, Foreign Policy Journal. He's worked for The Economist as well, he's been an advisor to the WTO some time ago. And today he's presenting this book uh, titled Aftershock Europe and the First Post Crisis World. He's been uh, an author of five other books as well, including Open World, The Truth About Globalization, and besides uh, many other achievements. He is well a uh, fellow of the Marshall Fund of the US. So, uh, without uh, further introduction, um, uh, I'm glad to introduce Philip Grand and Philip the uh, Thank you. Can you hear me right now? I hope yes. so. Yeah. Well, um, Thank you all for coming. Now, it's great to see so many friendly faces here, um, finally, for the launch um, of Aftershock. I want to start by thanking uh, the LSE's European Institute uh, for organising this event, Boris Fraser and uh, Ryan Mayhan in particular, uh, Lex and APCO Worldwide for sponsoring it, my agent, uh, Johnny Geller, uh, and everyone at Curtis Brown. Of course, Tim Whiting, Sophie McIver, and everyone at my publishers. Uh, Little Brown. My friend uh, Martin Fitzgerald for helping with the research uh, for the book. My father for providing helpful comments. Uh, Simon Long for providing many useful contacts uh, and for reading through the final manuscript. And everyone else um, who I don't have time, thankfully, to mention now. Thank you very much. Now, I can't cover everything uh, in the book uh, this evening, and you wouldn't want me uh, droning on for hours. So here are a few snapshots from it. You'll meet, <laughs> you'll meet Kitty, Sana, and other women who pick fruit for Tesco on South African farms. You'll experience the country of contrasts that is India. Former Australian <coughs> Prime Minister Bob Hawke shares his insight uh, on China. And starting on this suburban platform at rush hour, in America, you'll visit a company outside Chicago that feels threatened by trade with China. And you'll visit the cosmopolitan city of Vancouver and its funny side. <laughs> now, there's all that and more in Aftershock, and hopefully you'll soon find out. <coughs> now, the book begins with the financial crisis, the worst since the 1930s. But it's mainly about the world after the crisis, the dangers and the opportunities ahead. Not so long ago, we looked set for another Great Depression. But unlike in the 1930s, governments and central banks rode to the rescue. They propped up the banking system, they slashed interest rates to zero, they pumped loads of money into the economy, and they injected a fiscal stimulus. And it certainly helped. 
but we were also lucky. We came perilously close to financial Armageddon. And here we are now. Bankers' bonuses are back, house prices are soaring, while unemployment is rising, and debts pile up, and frictions with China are mounting, and the planet is overheating. Is this really sustainable? I believe that unless we change course, we could suffer an even bigger crisis for which our over-indebted governments could not save us. Next time, our luck may run out. Now, to experience a depression, you don't need to travel back in time. Volcano ash permitting, Iceland is only a three-hour flight. <coughs> and there, I met an unlikely property speculator called Thorvaldo Thorvaldsson. He's a carpenter. And you'll see to his left behind him is a bust of Lenin. In fact, everything about him is red. His shirt, his t-shirt, even his hair. Yet even he got carried away by the financial frenzy that gripped Iceland in the years before the crisis. And since that crisis, houses have halved in value, so has the currency, the stock market has fallen by more than 90%, consumer spending has fallen by a third, and so has government spending. And in the UK and the Dutch governments are demanding that ordinary Icelanders foot the bill for the collapse of ICESAVE, the Internet Savings Bank. Every man, woman and child in Iceland is expected to foot the bill, £11,000 each. And no wonder then that they protest that they have become ice slaves. Now Iceland is a weird and wonderful place, and if you haven't been, you should especially now, because they need all the money that they can get. <laughs> and when its banks collapsed, the internet buzzed with jokes like, what's the capital of Iceland? $20. <laughs> and it does seem laughable that a country with a population smaller than Camden and Islington combined became a global financial centre. But worryingly, Britain is more like Iceland than many people realise. Willem Boiter, my former colleague at the European Institute, calls London Reykjavik on Thames. Because while Iceland's banks grew so big that their often dodgy assets came to be nine times as large as the whole economy, in Britain's case, they're five times as large as our economy. Royal Bank of Scotland alone had assets worth more than 166% of UK GDP. And when Gordon Brown stepped in to save the banks, he in effect pledged all of our future incomes as collateral against banks' losses. If the economy had plunged into depression, he could have lumbered British taxpayers with an Icelandic-sized bill. And then since the crisis, the big banks have got even bigger, even riskier, while government's capacities to borrow has shrunk. So Iceland is a warning of what could happen to us if the bailed out banks that were deemed too big to fail one day prove too big to save. Now, it may be reassuring to think that the crisis was a once-in-a-lifetime event, but in fact, bubbles have been getting bigger, broader, and more common recently. At the height of Japan's bubble in the late 1990s, the grounds of the Imperial Palace in Tokyo were more expensive than the whole of California. During the dot-com bubble of the late 90s, internet companies reached absurd valuations. And during the rec recent bubble, the biggest and most global in history, house prices in America nearly trebled, in Britain they more than trebled, and in Ireland they quadrupled. And that bubble involved a toxic combination of rampant pro property speculation, an unprecedented increase in personal debt, and banks who borrowed too much, let far too easily, and spawned devilish new, new financial products that sucked in cash from global investors in complex and opaque ways. Basically, banks placed and enabled others to place bets on top of bets on top of bets. And at each turn, they earned a juicy commission. Now, the details of the crisis are extremely complex, but the underlying story is simple and familiar. Lulled into a false sense of security by a long period of low interest rates and stable economic growth, 
Ordinary people, bankers and financial investors, borrowed vast sums and gambled that house prices couldn't fall. And of course we know they were wrong. And the notion that a whole society can get rich by swapping more or less the same stock of houses among each other at ever more inflated prices is a delusion. Yet even now, it has a vice-like grip on the British imagination. And since the banks were raking it in, the economy was booming, tax receipts were pouring in, the pressure to leave that golden goose alone was overwhelming. And of course, bankers' political donations and lobbying also helped. Above all, politicians came to believe that what was good for Wall Street was good for America, and what was good for the city was good for Britain. Now fast forward to today, and what do you see? House prices are soaring again. In London, they are 16% higher than a year ago. A typical UK home costs more than twice what it did a decade ago, and a bit more than it did in August, 19, August 2008, the month before Lehman Mothers collapsed. The stock market has bounced back too. Despite its recent turmoil, it's still just above where it was 18 months ago. The blue line is 18 months ago. And then you see, while Goldman, Goldman Sachs' price has taken a knock since it was accused of fraud by American regulators, its stock price too is back to where it was before Lehman Brothers collapsed. So if you look at the housing market or the financial market, it's almost as if the financial crisis and the recession had never happened. And then you look at the real economy of output and jobs. Now yes, the economy is growing again. It's fractionally bigger than it was at the end of 2009. But it's still smaller than a year ago. It's more than 5% smaller than two, year, two years ago. And it's more than 10% smaller than it would have been if it had carried on growing as fast as it was from 2000 to 2008. And because the pound has collapsed against the dollar and the euro, we're all much poorer than we thought we were, as everyone who's been abroad knows all too well. And then, of course, nearly a million people have lost their jobs. Two and a half million in total are unemployed. And the only silver lining is that unemployment has so far risen much less than in the 1980s or in the 1990s recession. And compared to other advanced economies, Britain's unemployment rate remains relatively low. But a black hole has opened up in the government's finances. This year, the British government is expected to have the biggest deficit among all advanced economies. It's going to borrow 160 billion pounds, one of every pounds, four pounds it spends. And yes, some of that deficit will shrink as the economy recovers, but the new government is still going to have to raise taxes and cut spending a lot in order to reduce its benefit borrowing. And until then, Britain's debt is going to carry on soaring. Now, fortunately, it was quite low before the crisis started, but it's set to reach around 90% of GDP uh, within two years. Now, if you see Greece there at the top, we're nowhere near Greece. But then neither is Portugal, nor Spain, and panic has been spreading there. And the thing about panic is that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If investors lose confidence in the government's economic management for whatever reason, good or bad, we could, we could witness a run on the pound and UK government bonds. And that new 750 billion euro uh, stabilisation fund that EU leaders uh, agreed yesterday will only protect euro members, not Britain. Now whatever happens, Britain and other <coughs> European economies face difficult years ahead. The three immediate priorities are fixing the banking system, cutting the deficit and encouraging healthier and more balanced future <coughs> growth. Longer term, we need to adjust to the rise of China and other emerging economies, and we need to cope with climate change. Now let's start with the banks. At the moment, these banks that we bailed out can borrow vast sums for almost nothing from the Bank of England and other central banks. But instead of lending that on to small businesses that desperately need credit, and the new ones which will create the new jobs and growth of the future, they're making easy profits by buying government bonds, 
or more speculative assets, safe in the knowledge that governments will bail them out if they go wrong, as they just have in Greece. So this flood of easy money it pumps up asset prices, but does little to benefit the rest of the economy. It isn't even doing much to recapitalize the banks, because they're paying out most of their easy profits on dividends to shareholders and undeserved bonuses to unrepentant bankers. So in these exceptional times, when the government has a controlling stake in Northern Rock, in RBS and in Lloyds, it should direct them to lend more <coughs> to sound borrowers. And it should also ban all banks, all of which have benefited from government guarantees, from paying out bonuses and dividends until they have enough cash reserves and enough capital to provide an adequate cushion against future losses. And together, G20 governments need to implement radical financial reforms. Now, while the banks were on their knees, a golden opportunity was missed to break finance's stranglehold over the economy. And now, this monstrous state-sponsored kleptocracy is back, it's bigger and worse than ever, and its grip will be much harder to break. But this crony, crony capitalism must be dismantled. It is absolutely unacceptable that some banks deemed too big to fail can gamble at public expense. Heads they win, tails taxpayers lose. Capitalism without risk of failure is like power without accountability. It corrupts absolutely. Now for a start, we need better regulation. Banks must be compelled to hold a much larger buffer of capital that rises in boom times to limit excessive risk taking. And once that is in place, bankers' bonuses should be paid in shares that cannot be sold for a long time, so they lose out if their bets go wrong. And to avoid future bailouts, banks must be restructured so they can be wound up quickly and easily if need be. Now all of that is essential, but the problem is bigger than that, because even in good times, big banks are far too powerful. Government-backed, riddled with conflicts of interest, they abuse their privileged position as gatekeepers of capital markets. Now they say, look, we make huge profits, that's a contribution to society. No it isn't, their monopolistic profits, profits are a cost to society. And since even the best regulation is not fail-safe, in the event of a crisis, politicians would still come under huge pressure to bail them out. So to increase competition, to curb banks' power, and to ensure that they are allowed to fail, they must be broken up. This crisis has caused the worst recession in living memory, mass unemployment, an alarming rise in government debt. The next one could threaten government solvency, the open world economy, even liberal democracy. In 1933, Franklin D. Roosevelt faced down J.P. Morgan and broke up that giant bank. Today's leaders should follow his example. Now the second priority is fixing the deficit. While demand remains depressed, it would be premature to make cuts. The danger, though, is that markets are going to force government's hands. <coughs> Sooner rather than later, then, Britain and other European economies are going to have to raise taxes and cut spending. But the measures have to be fair, and they have to do as little damage as possible to the rest of the economy. Otherwise, we could have riots in the streets, like Greece, or we could throttle the recovery. So public spending cuts should spare the vulnerable. Cutting investment in infrastructure and in lifelong learning is a false economy. And to prevent house prices soaring and the long waiting list for social housing growing in any further, we urgently need to build more homes. And the wisest way to cut the deficit is to accelerate desirable reforms, encourage people to retire later. As we live longer, we must work longer and save more if we're going to enjoy a comfortable retirement. And it's only fair that baby boomers should bear some of the burden of adjustment. Tax harmful things, like carbon emissions. And if you raise the tax as emissions fall, that gives you a steady stream of revenue and it stimulates clean tech industries and the job, green jobs of the future. If the G20 can agree on it, a global tax on financial transactions could also raise lots of cash. After all, people pay stamp duty when they buy shares. So why shouldn't larger financial transactions also be taxed? 
A bold government might also legalise drugs and tax them as it does alcohol and nicotine. But the most important reform is to make the tax system fairer and less harmful to jobs and growth by cutting tax on labour and increasing, in, introducing a tax on land values. Now, a land tax could raise huge sums, it could, and it could also stabilise the economy by limiting property speculation. And it would also boost economic growth, because when you tax work, it costs jobs, and it causes people to put in less effort. But land is in fixed supply, and it can't be spirited away to a tax haven. Above all, a land tax would be fair. It's astonishing. Land in Britain is more unequally distributed than in Brazil. There, 1% of the population owns 49% of the land. Here, 0.3% of the population owns 69% of Britain. Britain's biggest landowner, the Duke of Buccleuch, owns 277,000 acres because he descends from a man who seized vast swathes of Scotland. And instead of being taxed, he gets huge handouts from Europe's common agricultural policy. In Spain, the Duchess of Alba owns 2.5 million acres. And the crucial thing is that land goes up in value each year, not because of landowners' hard work, but because of that of others. As talented and hard-working people like you have flocked to London, the value of the 300 acres of fields, now Mayfair and Bel Belgravia, passed down to successive Dukes of Westminster, has skyrocketed to an estimated £6.5 billion. Pounds. Now surely you should be taxing that windfall gain rather than the work of those who generated it. And since infrastructure investment raises surrounding land values, a land tax could help pay for new tube lines, for Crossrail, for the high-speed rail network that Britain so desperately needs. It's high time that we face down the ultimate vested interest, the monopolists who still own most of Britain. Now, fixing the banks and reforming the tax system are essential parts of the third priority, shifting the economy towards more balanced and healthier patterns of growth. Americans and Britons need to learn to live within their means. A house is a place to live, not a cash machine. Our economy must rely less on housing and finance and invest more in the exporting industries of the future. At the same time, the Germans and the Japanese, who have been squirrelling away nuts for a rainy day, need to spend more, because storms don't come much bigger than this. They need to rely less on exporting and develop sectors that service domestic needs. And all governments need to tackle the obstacles that prevent businesses and people from adjusting, gummed up labour markets, entrenched producer interests, barriers to innovation and enterprise, misaligned currencies. Open up further to foreign trade, investment and people, encourage clean technologies, help people retrain and find new jobs, and make it safe for emerging economies to tap global capital markets. Now, of course it won't be easy. The bubble mentality is hard to break, and so are deeply ingrained savings habits. The dominant financial interests in Britain and America, and the export ones in Germany, Japan and Asia, are going to fight reform tooth and nail. But if we slip into the, back into the bad old ways, inflate yet another bubble to try to rescue us from the last, it will all end in tears. Now ultimately, a sustainable recovery will come from developing new ideas and businesses that create jobs and enhance productivity. And it will also come from exporting to emerging economies like China, India and Brazil, where there is plenty of pent-up demand. Now, you can, as you can see from the chart, emerging economies, that's the green line, are leading the world out of recession. You see the red line, which is advanced economies, we're just struggling out a bit. The green, the green ones are growing at 8% a year, as fast as they were before the crash. And they are the ones who account for nearly all of the growth now in the world economy. Not only that, they are transforming the global economy before our eyes. Now, we all know that China is developing fast. But visiting China, re visiting Shanghai, really brings it home. The buzz is exhilarating. That maglev train into town accelerates to 431 kilometers an hour in just four minutes. 
It certainly beats the Standard Express. <laughs> and then you drive across Luku Bridge, and you feel like you're flying, Blade Runner style, through that cityscape with punctuated by massive skyscrapers. And what a crazy skyline it is. Now, of course, Shanghai is not representative of China, but neither is London and Britain, for that matter. But it's still a window on the future. In the past few years, it spent $45 billion, that's more than the British government's fiscal stimulus, to re reinvent itself for the Expo, which has just opened. Two new airport terminals, eight new tube lines, new parks, roads, bridges, a new stadium, and a performing arts centre shaped like a flying saucer. And like the great exhibition in Victorian London in 1851, or the Eiffel Tower erected for the 1889 World's Fair in Paris, the Expo signals that China is now an economic powerhouse. <coughs> and I'm glad to say the British Pavilion looks great. And so does Estonia's. <laughs> but China's, of course, is the biggest. Now, by some measures, emerging economies account for already half of the world economy. And in the years ahead, they're likely to account for the bulk of the world's growth. And that will affect everything from energy use to how the world economy is run. Inextricably, the center of gravity of the world economy is shifting east and south. Now, of course, it's a tragedy that poverty remains extreme for the bottom billion who live in states that are incapable of providing for their basic needs and cannot tap into the global economy. They urgently need our help, as I discussed in my first book, Open World. But life is looking up for most of the developing world. In 1990, 63% of people in developing countries lived on less than $2 a day. By 2005, 15 years later, that was down to 47%. And of course, $2 goes much further in rural India than it does in central London. 1.2 billion more people live on between $2 and $13 a day. Half of the developing world is now middle class. In India, average incomes doubled between 1994 and 2008. And in China, they multiplied by 10, by 10, between 1980 and 2008. And they've doubled since the turn of the century. Now if you look, these maps show the income distribution in China. The red line is the middle class threshold when you're earning $3,900 adjusted for differences in purchasing power. And you see in 1980, everyone's below that. By 1995, a big chunk is above it. And you see now in 2008, nearly everyone is above it. Now, three in eight people on the planet live in China and India. And if their living standards continue to rise at 8% a year, they'll double every nine years and quadruple in 18. By 2025, 1.3 billion Chinese, many of whom were starving as recently as the 1970s, could be as prosperous as the Portuguese are today. That's fantastic news. It offers unprecedented opportunities for billions of people to enjoy a better life. It will make the world much fairer and safer. And it can benefit people in rich countries too. New jobs, new businesses, new technologies, a wider choice of cheaper and better imports. Brazil, for instance, could feed the world. India's entrepreneurial companies are snapping up and turning around Western ones, creating new jobs and better products for us. Tetley T, Chorus, that's the old British steel, Land Rover and Jaguar. And in the book, you'll meet Baba Kalyani, an Indian industrialist whose father was a penniless peasant and whose company probably supplied some of the parts in your car. And with China, the world's fastest growing consumer market, any company that taps into it can prosper. In the book, you'll meet Darius Stenberg, a young Swedish guy who is minting it by selling dental alloys to help Chinese people obtain a nicer smile. And you'll see Chinese tourists, they spent $43 billion last year. A few years ago, there were none, now $43 billion. In a few years, they may be as ubiquitous as Japanese ones were in the 1980s. In fact, the McKinsey Global Institute reckons that over the next 15 years, Chinese consumers could generate nearly a fifth of the <coughs> consumption growth, and with suitable reforms, up to a quarter of it. And those reforms are things like establishing a proper welfare state, developing service sector businesses that create lots of jobs, and allowing the currency to appreciate 
to accommodate and accelerate those changes. So let's face it, China and other emerging economies can help rescue the, rescue the world, help rescue us from this crisis, and eventually they can become the engine of the world economy. Already, China's demand for imports is boosting growth across the world, including in Africa, lifting millions out of poverty. Britain's exports to China more than quadrupled in the past decade. So yes, of course, Europeans often worry where tomorrow's jobs will come from. We're all worried that our jobs are going to go to China. But increasingly, in fact, our jobs are going to come from selling to China, India, and other emerging economies. But if China and India start consuming as much energy as we do, surely the planet is going to fry. Many people seem, seem to think that a low-carbon future requires us to give up all the trappings of modern life. You may have watched Justin Rowland, BBC Newsnight's self-styled ethical man who spent a year trying to live as greenly as possible. That's him, it's a composting, composted burial, in case you're asking. <laughs> uh, he gave up the family car, he stopped eating meat, he switched the lights off, he collected rainwater, he made compost, and he performed all sorts of unfavorable stunts like that for the television screen. And at the end of that excruciatingly unsustainable experiment, his new current carbon footprint was measured, and it was only 20% lower. And yet climate scientists tell us that if we're going to stop uh, the planet from overheating, we need to halve carbon emissions by 2050, and rich countries need to slash them by 80%. So it's essential that we find the cheapest and the smartest ways of tackling climate change, and the cost of that change are shared fairly. But what if a low carbon future was clean and alluring, rather than a return to the dark ages? Now, one of the highlights of my trip around the world was for this for research for the book was taking a Tesla Roadster for a spin in the Californian sunshine. And I could have driven off into the sunset. Unfortunately, I had another interview to go to, and the car wasn't mine. But um, the amazing thing about that Tesla, which accelerates to, to 0 to 60 in four seconds, is that it's powered by batteries like those in laptop computers. And while it's an American company, it was founded by an immigrant from South Africa who made his fortune in the US by developing PayPal. Its chief financial officer is from India, and the car is made in the largest factory here in Britain from parts sourced around the world. Now, of course, most of us can't afford a top-of-the-range sports car. So after my test drive, I thought of giving up food and other non-essentials <laughs> in order to save up for one. But car makers are scrambling to produce cheaper electric cars, and their price will fall as technology improves and companies reach economies of scale. And among the leading players are an Indian company called Reva. They make the boxy <coughs> G-Wiz cars you might have seen on London streets. And China's BYD, which stands for Build Your Dreams, a company that makes most of the world's mobile phone batteries. Now Tesla, of course, may not succeed. Better products may come along. But cleaner technologies can make all the difference. Plastics made from plants, cars fueled on sugarcane can waste, smart electricity grids, the possibilities are endless. The most important thing, though, is we need to find substitutes for carbon-based energy. Tap the limitless energy of the sun, the wind, and the atom, and the false choice between growth and greenery is removed. And if governments remove, provide sufficient incentives now and a credible enough commitment for the future, an investment continues to pour into clean tech research with some of the world's brightest minds and sharpest business people <coughs> competing to clean up and to save the planet, then existing technologies can become cheaper and new ones will emerge. There are lots of examples of that in the book. Suddenly, the seemingly impractical or implausible can become possible, then probable. After all, it would be easy to jettison fossil fuels if clean tech is both greener and cheaper. Carbon-based <coughs> energy has been a fantastic engine for human progress, but it's always had big downsides. Smog, war, dependence on nasty dictatorships, and now it endangers the planet. But oil, gas, and coal are just means to an end. What is really valuable are the unprecedented opportunities of modern living, an escape from drudgery in the home, 
the mind-broadening delights of foreign travel, cool buildings in hot countries, the freedom to drive where we please. And their extension from a rich minority to the rest of the world is a cause for celebration, not despair. So rather than rejecting modern lifestyles or trying to deny them to others, the priority must be to find new sources of energy. And as Silicon Valley shows, the surest way to get there as quickly and as cheaply as possible is to keep economies open and allow people, new ideas and new technologies to spark off each other. The ongoing challenge for rich countries is going to be to adapt to the rise of emerging ones. China looks set to overtake America as the world's biggest economy uh, sometime in the 2020s. And of course there'll be set setbacks along the way, but increasingly the world economy is going to take its cues from Shanghai, from Mumbai and from Sao Paulo. And that's going to require adjustments. The rest can no longer boss the rest, the West can no longer boss the rest around. And nor can it presume that it always knows best. And that may be a particularly big shock for America. Europeans will have to give up their disproportionate voice in global institutions like the, uh, the, the IMF. Though maybe not, because they've already cornered five of the 20 seats at the G20. And eventually, of course, though, emerging economies will have to get their rightful place. And yes, the West's share of the global economy is going to shrink, but our living standards will grow faster thanks to emerging economies' success. Whether it is, whether it is Brazilian food, Korean mobile phones, Chilean Chinese solar technology, Indian electric cars, Vietnamese shoes, we can all benefit from emerging economies' dynamism. Not just cheaper imports, but better ones. Not just imitated technologies, but innovative ones. People and ideas moving in both directions. Now we tend to think of immigration of movement to places like Britain, Europe and America. But increasingly, migrants are moving in all directions, east as well as west, south as well as north. There are more Brits abroad than foreigners in Britain. And they're starting to move to China. There are already more than 600,000 foreigners in China. That's 13 times more than 13 years ago. And they include Westerners working there illegally. <laughs> Westerners, illegal immigrants, whatever next. <laughs> and migration is also less permanent than it was, because in the age of Ryanair and the internet, migrants often move again, back home or somewhere else. A quarter of those who arrived in Britain in 1998, sorry, only a quarter of those who arrived in Britain in 1998 are still here. And these newly mobile people are a bit like bees. They're flying from flower to flower and they're cross-pollinating them. So perhaps we should jettison the word immigration and start talking instead about a kaleidoscope of mobility. And that promises a whole new world of opportunities for people, a wider and more flexible pool of talent for companies, and a proliferation of new ideas and businesses, both within economies and across global migrant networks. Now globally, of course, it's still the privilege of the few. But among the 27 countries of the EU, most and soon all of the 500 million people can move freely. Now who would have guessed 20 years ago that East Europeans would be free to live and work anywhere they want in Western Europe? Who would have dared think that open borders from Estonia to Estepona would soon be perceived as normal? And this remarkable experiment with open borders has shredded many of the myths about it. No, not everyone has come, and many of those who did have already left again. All 75 million East Europeans could have moved to Britain, only one million have, and over half of them have gone again. Many move back and forth regularly, like international commuters. Society hasn't collapsed. Recent arrivals have more than paid their way. In fact, newcomers of all cultural backgrounds are twice as lucky, twice as likely, to start a new business as people born in Britain. And would London be half as vibrant as rich and half as, half as rich without a constant un influx of people, not just from around the country, but also from around the world. And then think, well, Romania is poorer than Mexico. And if freedom of movement works so well within the EU, why wouldn't it well work well elsewhere too? <coughs> now, nobody could have guessed when he arrived as a child refugee from the Soviet Union that Sergei Brin was going to go on and co-found Google. If he'd been denied entry, 
America would never have realized the opportunity it had missed. Now think about it, how many potential Sergei Brins does Europe turn away? And at what cost? Now, prospects for freeing up, global, freeing up global migration may seem bleak for now, but things could change. As baby boomers start to retire, they're going to stop worrying about who's going to take my job and start thinking, who's going to look after me when I need care? Young people who've grown up in a culturally diverse background tend to be more open to newcomers. And pragmatism can also persuade, because surely it's better if people cross borders safely and legally rather than risk their lives and then live outside the law. Above all, we need to persuade people that preventing others from moving freely is an unacceptable violation of their human rights. Now, unfortunately, the crisis is causing an upsurge of protectionism against products as well as people. And then, of course, there's a danger of an even bigger backlash that could wreck the recovery, it could pit emerging powers against existing ones and jeopardise efforts to combat climate change. And that damage could be huge and lasting because the last time we closed our borders in the 1920s and the 1930s, it took decades and a world war to open them up again. We must not make that mistake again. Now the crisis has depressed not just our economy, but our mood. Many Europeans worry that their best days are behind us. People want to hide away from the world and hunker down. And the cheerfulness of the Chinese, the Indians and the Brazilians only darkens our gloom. <laughs> and it's true, yes, the present is painful and the future is full of dangers. Another cycle of bubble, bust and bailout. A Greek-style debt crisis. A retreat into protectionism and prejudice. A climate catastrophe. But if we fix global finance, reform the tax system, reshape the UK and world economy on, along healthier lines, open up economies and societies and embrace a low carbon future, then a safer, fairer, richer and cleaner world is possible. The world is still rich with, op with opportunities for progress if we reach out and grab them. The boundless op optimism of people in emerging economies should inspire us, not frighten us. Until recently, we were tapping the brain power of only a tiny minority of humanity. Wang Chuan Fu, the guy who founded BYD, grew up on a farm in extreme poverty in a country where enterprise was forbidden. And now, his company's electric cars are at the cutting edge of technology. The Industrial Revolution raised the living standards of a tiny fraction of, my, of humanity above the rest. And now, it is lifting up most people, though sadly not yet all. But just think how much faster, how much further humanity could progress if Africa emulated China's success, if women were liberated in the Arab world, if people were set free to live and work wherever they want, if Silicon Valley's entrepreneurial magic cast its spell on Europe, and if every person, every young person in Britain got a fair start in life. Now Thomas Friedman wrote a best-selling book called the world is flat. But in reality, the world is anything but flat. Because the biggest determinant of your life chances is not how talented you are, it's not how hard you work, it's where you were born and who your parents were. And an open world made up of open societies can help change that. Because it's not just a matter of breaking down border barriers, it's about breaking down barriers within society and changing people's attitudes. It's about combating discrimination, xenophobia, and exclusion. It's about embracing difference and change. So the new dividing line in politics is between those who believe in dynamic, open, and progressive societies, and those who want to shut the doors and turn the clock back. Open societies can create new freedoms, new opportunities, new ideas, greater variety and diversity, better lives in the broadest sense. In other words, Progress. In, in Amartya Sen's words, progress is about expanding the power to do things, the freedom and the capacity to realise your dreams. And that's why we also need progressive governments that enforce fair laws, promote social mobility, equip people for change, catch us when we fall and break down the monopolistic bastions of land ownership and finance. Above all though, we need optimism. 
the optimism to try to improve things, invest in the future and embrace change, the optimism that views challenges, even crises, as opening up new possibilities. Crises don't come much bigger than this. The pain is undeniable. The injustice, flagrant. The world is a desperately unfair place, but it is also full of promise. We would be mad to close ourselves off to its possibilities. Let's give our future a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I admire your optimism and I hope I'm not going to sound like a damper on it. But if I could just raise three slight problems about all this. One is that uh, um, while absolutely our, our unemployment is much less than we expected it to be in the financial crisis, whereas the Americans, of course, is much higher. As Joseph Speaker said here recently, I mean, maybe as high with part time jobs and so on as 17, 80 percent, uh, we're about when we do get a government, which doesn't look as if it would be a progressive government. Um, that we'll actually have very significant cuts in public sector spending in the public sector so that we may just be on the verge of a vast increase in our unemployment. The second thing is about rebalancing the economy. Um, that, you know, everybody seems to talk about green technology. I don't know whether we're going to survive and anything else by wind farms, but we've hardly got a good reputation in this country of choosing pretty national champions, which isn't exactly something we've done much of late since the Hill and Edith Pimp from the 1960s. Uh, and Sarkozy is slightly better at it than we are. So how are we going to actually rebalance the economy quickly enough when the financial sector here is far too dominant, far more dominant than the United States? And just one final, very brief point is about the Chinese and about the Chinese consumer. I've been at numerous uh, lectures here, the China Development Forum here, and hear people like Danny Kwa and many others talking about the great difficulty of Chinese savings. They're basically persuading the Chinese to spend, but they don't have a welfare state, they don't have a health service, and therefore their immediate inclination is to save because they need to in order to just pay those absolute essentials which we in this country and in the West take for granted. Well, the West, part of the United States, that is. Um, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I said so far, I'm full of the mind my, my around rising. Rise when um, the government starts cutting, uh, and clearly um, uh, that, that's quite likely. Um, in terms of um, rebalancing, I wasn't advocating uh, picking national champions. Um, one of the things, while the, during the long boom, um, when the finance, financial sector grew too big, the pound became incredibly overvalued, uh, and as it did, that squeezed the rest of the economy. Um, and now that the pound has collapsed, uh, that is going to naturally lead. Uh, to um, uh, a regrowth of not just manufacturing but other um, uh, service uh, sector, sector industries. Um, clearly also, I think that uh, if we break our uh, obsession uh, with property speculation, you know, three quarters of bank lending, three quarters of bank lending goes into property. Um, if we start investing uh, in productive sectors, rather than diverting our cash into unproductive ones like bricks and mortar, uh, then there's much more possibilities. Um, I, 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 I'd never be the one to say that, um, that uh, wind farms are, are, are going, we're all going to be building wind farms. Uh, was, that was just one example. In terms of the Chinese consumer, you're right, at the moment, Chinese consumer spending is about $1.6 trillion, uh, whereas um, American consumer spending is about $10 trillion, six times bigger. But, Chinese consumer spending is growing at 16% a year. Now, if you think about it, 16% a year of a small number is actually still quite a large number. Um, and, um, and, and therefore, even now, it, it's, consuming, it's contributing a lot to consumption growth. And of course, China can also contribute to the world economy through investment. If you think about it, all these German companies 
who were sending out uh, machine tools and capital equipment to build all these new railways and roads and so on. And you, the Chinese are planning to build, guess, listen to this, 400 million new homes in the next 20 years. Now think about what that means in terms of building supply. If they all start shopping at Ikea, think what that means. <laughs> you know, there is huge, huge, huge potential there. And of course China is not the whole emerging world. You know, there's also India, there's also Brazil, there's also Korea, there's also Mexico. Um, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not the only solution to the problem, but it's part of the solution. There's one question over there. Um. Uh, my question is, you mentioned many uh, lack of design and many problems in our new Europe. I agree we have many problems now. I agree we have great uh, crisis. But I do agree this is a very big crisis. This is a most great crisis. This most great crisis is about to over. So can you see any positive side of new Europe? Because we build the new Europe since 1957, May 8th. In the three years, last year, we are still on the learning process. If you see two or three years later, and it will, will be have to find future, we can all work out together. Can you answer me any possible side you can see? Can you see any positive side? Positive. And the public side of the euro in this one or two years. Sure. I mean, there's one more, more question over there. Gentleman in the middle, right in the middle. Thank you. Um, I appreciate a lot of the points you said. However, I don't think your analysis from my think tank's perspective is deep enough. For instance, um, I would say we don't just need radical reforms, but a paradigm shift. Could you tell me what think tank you're from? Uh, Global Vision 2000. Right. Okay. Um, uh, for instance, your analysis, just looking at the title, Aftershock, some Western thinkers were talking openly about the second wave of the financial tsunami right now. Uh, you're, you're assuming it's over. A think tank based at Canary World, Ashka, um, talked about seven bubbles coming which will be bursting. You know, uh, have you actually got the right diagnosis? Point one. Point two um, is, uh, I think, at the center of all of this analysis is really money and the control of money by financial oligarchies. Unless we understand the nature of money and its control, we're not going to solve the problem. Uh, for instance, the UN, what I call the global financial architecture, the UN, IM, IMF, World Bank, WTO, and the imperial dollar, that is an architecture. It's not called cuckoo land. It has to be deconstructed and then reconstructed. The system is based on many analysis and, and, uh, thinkers. It is bankrupt. We've got a quadrillion derivative bubble. It cannot be bailed out. The taxpayers are bearing the burden. Your, your stats have been manipulated. There is financial warfare going on between the dollar and the euro, for instance, right now. Look at Goldman Sachs recently. Um, so uh, basically, money is going to be a servant of the people, not the master. It has to be liberated. Your analysis needs thorough re-examination. Thank you. All right. Um, let me just sum this up. In terms of the, the first question about what is bright about Europe, um, you know, as I said, I think, I think there are lots of reasons uh, to be optimistic. Perhaps not uh, in the immediate future, but certainly um, a few years, uh, a few years ahead. And the question of whether uh, we succeed is whether we do the things um, which I suggest, which is, you know, we need to fix the banking system. Um, you know, we need to rebalance um, the economy to encourage. Um, uh, you know, new motives of growth. And within, within Europe, the crucial dynamic is between um, uh, Germany, which has a huge surplus, and the rest of the countries, which have a huge deficit. And Germany needs to stimulate its economy more uh, if peripheral economies um, are going to get out of this crisis. Uh, we need to resist protectionism so that we carry on trading with China and India and other emerging economies, benefiting us uh, and benefiting um, uh, them. 
So that, 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 that I think, are, are all reasons for optimism. In terms of the gentleman there from Global Vision 2000, um, I'm not assuming the crisis is over, but Aftershock is just the title of the book. Um, you know, I think the, the crisis is ongoing. The worst of the crisis looks like it's over. There were, you know, we're, in recent, uh, recent weeks, we've had a sovereign debt crisis um, uh, in Europe. Whether the new stabilization fund um, will put an end to it um, in, in the short term or not uh, is unclear. But yes, you know, there are other bubbles developing. At the moment, you see that um, a lot of this easy money which is being pumped up has been going into emerging markets. And so you see property in China going up, you see property in Brazil going up, you see their currencies, uh, the Brazil's currency and Australia's currency rising to painfully high levels. You have the danger, therefore, that all that happens of a repeat of the Asian crisis in 97, where you have loads of money flooding in, property in the stock market going out, and suddenly a loss of confidence, and bang, the whole house of cards comes down. And so, yes, that, 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 is, that is a possibility. And I think, um, I think that emerging economies ought to apply capital controls to stop money coming in before the money, before it becomes a problem. Um, so, um, in terms of whether finance should be a servant of people, not the master, uh, yes, I think we agree on that. Um, in terms of your sort of broader things, I'm not sure. What I want to say, and I think and this may, might, might have got lost, obviously, in all this, you know, attack on the banks. Finance itself is essential. You know, finance is finance is what help, helps new 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 businesses uh, to um, emerge. It's what helps um, existing ones uh, to grow. Um, uh, and that I have no problem whatsoever um, uh, with finance that isn't government backed, that doesn't involve um, conflicts of interest, which isn't monopolistic. On the contrary, it's absolutely essential. If you look, why is Silicon Valley so successful? Why does Google exist? Uh, why does Tesla exist? It's because there are willing people, venture capitalists, who are willing uh, to uh, take a punt um, on, um, on new technologies, um, and, and without them, we wouldn't have all these wonderful things. So, you know, yes, finance needs to be uh, the servant, not the master, uh, but also it has a positive role to play. <coughs> Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm a graduate student at the LSE studying a master's in China and higher perspective. So I'm really interested in uh, reading your book and seeing what you have to say about the emerging markets. Um, I just want to say, don't you think there's a gross misallocation of financial and human capital um, in the sense that you know what the LSE, I'm sure you know what the LSE is like that most graduates um, will, will run, run down the road to the to join Goldman Sachs rather than working on hard problems like building them at school or building um, green technology. Don't you think that um, London's missing something like that? I'm, I'm sure you might have heard of Paul Graham, who is in Silicon Valley, who's a prominent venture capitalist. Don't you think that you know, entrepreneurs here who have been very, very successful should replicate that model? And also that banks should be lending to um, useful causes rather than government failing our banks? Shouldn't there be, um, you know, shouldn't people who are running sound businesses or a student who wants to study a master at LSE get allowed to get a loan from a bank rather than being directly rejected rather than government bailing out um, risky um, financial institutions? Mm -hmm. I think on your last point, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, as I know from my, my <coughs> experience, um, getting a loan to do a master is incredibly difficult. And I think it's shocking, actually, that the government doesn't provide um, uh, you know, finance Know, repayable back through the tax system is much easier than Barra suggested to allow people to, to, to do their masters because you know it, it's almost impossible to do it otherwise you can't you can't borrow you can't borrow from the bank to do it um, and that's a that's a tragedy personally and it's crazy for the rest of the economy. Um, in terms of what you said about people going into finance, well yeah I mean one of the one of the factors of having a, a, a financial system that's grown so big, so profitable and salaries so high that it distorts the whole rest of the economy. You know, clever mathematicians who could have been, you know, devising internet programs or clever new technologies go to work in finance instead, um, and, and, that, and, and so that, that that distortion has affected um, the whole of the economy. You see that likewise with property. People who might have been entrepreneurs become property developers because it's seen as safe, safe and easy instead. So that distortion goes um, throughout all the economy. And actually, that's relatively recent because if you look back 30 years. Actually, salaries in finance, while they were, they were still high, they were not completely out of proportion with the rest of the economy as they are now. So the, 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 we can go back to a world like that, um, uh, I think is, is, is perfectly feasible. Right, yeah. Yeah.
Hi, yes. um, I have a question regarding your discussion of China and the opportunities there. I was wondering if you could possibly comment on the obvious political risk of particularly foreign companies coming to China um, and how you feel that that may impact sort of China's development in the you know, in the rest of the global economy. Uh, well, I'll sort of follow on from that. I mean, I think it's slightly churlish to uh, criticise you, because I think 99% of it, I, I like even the rhetorical flourishes. But I just think that um, the politics actually was the word that I thought was lacking in, in your analysis. So the first half being tax the rich, uh, the good old leftist slogan, and that's fine. Um, but I just thought that that was a bit more kind of concentrating on the fiscal strategy to the detriment of productivity, then you would go to productivity, that was fine. I just thought that you were sort of missing out, especially when you got into your environmental uh, critique, um, that the politics of environmentalism to a certain extent is part of the problem rather than part of the solution, I would, I would argue. In as much as a lot of the discussion that we currently find today around environmentalism <coughs> suggests that humanity or human beings or productivity or using energy or whatever it might be is part of the problem. Um, and you know, while we even have a rhetorical flourish saying that green growth is, is fine, generally growth, there's, there's an entire library of books out there suggesting that uh, growth is actually bad in terms of uh, environmental fatigue. Especially if you then project that onto China, if you are saying that oil, ironically you're saying oil is bad because of reliance on nasty dictatorships, but then you're happy with China, apparently. Um, but I'll let that go. China's doing very progressive things, but once you kind of project this notion about oil being bad, what, what impact does that then have on China's current economic dynamism, reliant on oil? Are you calling for a slowdown? Are you calling for uh, a, a, a hiatus period where you're going to allow them to grow for five, ten years? Or, or are you suggesting that maybe they should halt and, and uh, fall back on green technology? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, no, I don't, I don't think... I, I go into much more detail about this in the book, which I've sent you a copy of, so I'm sure you should have read it by now. Um, and um, I think that I explain that any global deal um, has to have provisions so that China, India, and other emerging economies make um, cuts uh, later rather than sooner. For us, it makes sense to make um, cuts uh, earlier. If you're, um, if you're China or India, you're growing at 8% a year, um, in, as I said, in 18 years, it will be four times as rich. Uh, and unless you think that the costs of um, carbon emissions are rising faster than that, and I, think, I don't think they are, uh, then actually it makes sense to, to, um, to, to change later. Having said that, you can see that China and India are actually at the forefront of green technologies, i.e. they can leapfrog many of the old technologies and go straight to the new ones. You see that among the biggest solar-powered companies is a, is a Chinese one, among the biggest wind power companies is a Chinese one. You know, BYD, as I said, they started off making mobile phones and they're now one of the world leaders in electric cars. Warren Buffett, the world's biggest investor, has bought into it. Um, and uh, you know, you're going to hear a lot more about BYD. So that, also, China is incredibly, incredibly wasteful in terms of its energy use. If you look at how much energy it uses per, per capita of GDP, for GDP, for a pound of GDP, it's absolutely massive. So there's a huge scope for China to grow you know, incredibly fast uh, and actually not increase its energy use um, simply by, simply, simply, um, by becoming uh, more efficient. And I think you're being a bit unfair in saying, you know, I'm, I, I'm, when I'm, I, 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 made very I made it very clear uh, that I thought um, that it was a good thing that people in China should be enjoying the lifestyles to which we are um, um, accustomed. Uh, and that the solution to the problem is not to deny uh, people those opportunities, but to change um, uh, the energy source. <coughs> More questions? Uh, well, folks, excuse my ideas. Um, your caveat about uh, finance, I think, was quite useful because I, I got a bit confused. That although I could see your capitalism without risk of failure being a problem, I thought that you were suggesting, and maybe you could clarify, that the solution to that was kind of more government regulation and you know fairer laws brought in by government. Whereas one of the things that strikes me about the UK is that it's over regulation that's held back a lot of economic development here. And that might well be in R and D, 
and kind of you know risk averse uh, regulation there, and it's certainly true in universities now, where over regulation of university a demand for outcomes and a real risk aversion is actually not helping at all. So maybe you can clarify that. But some of what you said did sound reminiscent of a kind of more populist banker bashing, and I know that you weren't indulging in that, but I, I think there is this problem, which is, is that the kind of sense of shock at the financial sector's uh, crisis has led to a real populist rejection of economic growth per se. I mean, it's already been referred to in terms of environmentalism, but there's much more a kind of sense. It's not just the bankers that are greedy, it's all of us. And while you talked about um, the Chinese wanting to have the same kind of standard of living as us and the excitement of that, there's more disillusion with us. I mean, you actually said we have to learn to live within our means. I mean, I have no intention of living within my means. I want to live way beyond them. And I never want to believe that this is it. You know, China can catch up with us, but we've got to put up with this. I, I, yeah, so I'm just, I'm, I'm just asking for a clarification because I think there is a political disillusion with the gains of economic growth that is expressed in the anti-financial sector as uh, generally understood. I'm sure you don't agree with that. Well, one more question. You seem very optimistic. Uh, your theories are pretty much dependent on the idea that growth is a good thing. And all this development, how it's taken place, with exponential growth, multiplied globally. We've still got limited resources in terms of clean water and land for food. We've had an artificial couple of hundred years due to the Hegel Bosch process of fossil fuels leading into our food chain and it being very efficient to bring good food feed enough of us. But given the limited, with peak oil coming off, the limited resources that we have in land and food terms, how are we going to feed all these people? Because as long as, as well as their lifestyle developing exponentially, just the numbers of people are as well. How are we going to provide them with clean water and land to grow good food? Witness the oil spill in New Mexico at the moment. Our seas depleted with fish, because we buy the fish. Where are we going to feed and how are we going to feed our people? I think those two questions actually go very well together because um, you're, you're expressing exactly what Claire was um, referring to um, uh, earlier. Um, Claire knows very well about not um, rejecting uh, economic growth. And when I said that we need to learn within our means, we need to learn to live, to live within our means, it means that we need to uh, not borrow debts that we can't pay back. It doesn't mean that we can't get richer every year by working harder, by becoming more productive. Um, the, the, the problem is debt fueled consumption, and in particular, debt secured against um, unsustainable um, house prices, uh, which is where most of the debt has been incurred. So that's the problem. It's not, it's not, um, uh, it's not consumption per se. Uh, it's not saying that we have to set up what we have. I think that, that uh, our, our lives 20 years from now are going to be much better um, uh, than, they, than they were 20 years ago. You know, you just think, even 10 years ago, I was, I was, at, the, I was at the LSE what, in 1995. I'd never used email. I'd never, had, never used um, the internet. Um, I just bought a mobile phone. Um, uh, so, you know, I didn't have a, I didn't have a laptop computer, um, and so on. Just about, just think how our lives have improved in that in that short space of, of 15 years. So you know, I, 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 I think that 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 that, that, that in of things um, will continue, and, and, and most of that comes through technology. Um, um, in terms of you know whether I'm banker bashing and, and being populistic. Um, well, perhaps the speech was a bit um, um, populistic. Um, I think that the right solution, as I said, is, is a mixture of, of government regulation to make banks safer. Banks were borrowing absolutely vast amounts, um, taking absolutely massive risks. The way that they earned higher returns was not actually by making more, uh, by by becoming more productive. It was by working their capital harder and harder and harder. And to like you know. 
you buy 100 houses with a, with a 99% mortgage, and so long as house prices are going up, you go, what's that clever? I'm making an absolute fortune. And house prices go down 1%, and you, you know, all of a sudden, you know, uh, you're bankrupt. And that's basically what the banks were doing. So um, we need government regulation so that um, they hold a bigger cushion of capital like they used to have so that if they run into trouble they don't go bust straight away. They need to hold bigger cash reserves so that if, they, so that, uh, if you have a panic like we've had, they don't immediately um, uh, run short of cash. You need better regulation so that you can actually wind them down, wind them up the same way that any other business that goes past. Um, quickly and rapidly, because if you think about it, the reason why the banks were, were bailed out is because they said, well, if these banks disappear, the whole system will collapse. Yes, and that's true. The same way that, you know, if the water company goes bust and we didn't have clean water, we'd be suffering pretty quickly. Um, and what do you do? Well, it doesn't mean um, that you bail out the water company. It means that you have systems to ensure that even if the water company goes bust, that the water pipes are still working effectively. And that's what we need to do. We need to, we, we should, we, we, you, need to, you need to safeguard the banking system, not existing banks. It's existing banks need to live by the same rules as other people, which means if they, go, if they make mistakes, they go bust. Their, their managers pay, their shareholders pay, and importantly, their creditors pay. Because all these people lend money to banks, and knowing very well that banks are risky investments. And that, bank, that, that is the money that banks then, on, then lent on. And then all of a sudden, banks went bust, and they go, on, well, hang on a minute, you know, I lent you money, and I demand that I get all my money back. Well, no, you made a mistake. You, 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 you took a risk, and you got it wrong. And you, shouldn't, you should not have been bailed out um, at government's expense. And that's abs you know, that is absolutely, absolutely wrong. Um, and and it's, not just, it's not just wrong morally. It's incredibly dangerous, because the more you do that, the more you encourage the, the, the excessive risk-taking, because, you know, it's, it's, it is. Uh, you know, heads we win and, ta and, and tails they lose. And it's even more so now because banks are worth absolutely, you know, banks, banks shares now are worth very, very little. Um, uh, if, um, uh, if you make a big gamble now, it could soar, you could make loads of money, and if it doesn't pay off and it's an incredibly risky bet, well, who cares because the government's there to pick it up. So it's even more dangerous now than it was before. That's what I was saying. It's the right mixture, the right mixture of, of, of regulation to make banks safer and the same as letting them live and die in the market the way that any other uh, business um, should. And, 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 and there are reforms that make that possible. In terms of, in terms of this lady's here about the growth is good, I, 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 I happen to do, I mean, I do think the growth is good. Uh, and I think that people in developing countries in particular um, have a right um, to enjoy the, the lifestyles that we take for granted. Um, and I think it's fantastic that they're finally able um, to do so. In terms of limited resources, I've already explained one of the limited resources, which is carbon-based energy. First of all, it's not running out. Um, there's plenty of oil, there's plenty of coal. The reason to act is not that it's running out. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's to prevent the risk of climate, of climate change. Uh, and therefore, we need to change the energy source. And I'm optimistic there are already, there are already um, um, sun, farm, uh, sun um, plants in the Nevada desert which are you know, as cheap um, as, as oil and coal-based energy. There are wind farms already uh, which are getting almost as cheap um, as um, coal-based energy. We can make that shift within um, a short period of time um, uh, to, to, to new forms of energy. In terms of clean water, you look at the cost of desalination plants is falling massively. They're now, they're now, they can now create clean water out of salt water um, for a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the energy use they used to do. And so you know, a lot of that constraint about water um, um, uh, doesn't exist. In Britain, I mean, it's astonishing. Britain receives more rainfall than loads of other countries, and we have a shortage of water. And that's not, and that's, that's really simply because we don't have, uh, don't have enough reservoirs. It, it's raining all the time. We just waste most of the water. We don't have enough reservoirs. The pipes leak. We lose loads of it. Um, in, terms of, in terms of land for food, agricultural productivity so far has continued rising faster than population growth. And Malthus, obviously famously 2,000 years ago, warned war, war that it wouldn't. Um, uh, and, um, and so far he's been proved wrong. In terms of seeing other people as a problem, again, I think other people are great. I don't, and I think, it's even, it's, I, think it's, I think it's immoral to say to people in developing countries, don't have children. You know, it's all right for us <coughs> to exist, but you shouldn't have children. Um, on the basis of the advice of Paul Ehrlich, who wrote the Population Bomb, the, the Indian government adopted a sterilization program in the 1970s. Of course, they only sterilized poor people. Um, uh, and then soon, thankfully, they, they saw that their senses and, and, and turned around. 
Um, I, uh, and and uh, I, I don't think that I don't think it's morally right for us um, uh, to to um, to say that. I personally have no children. I'm never going to have children, so I'm not adding to population growth. So I'm not biased. <laughs> <laughs> of this financial crisis you know, is, is basically what happened in, in Yeltsin's Russia. You know, there was a financial crisis in 1998. The ruble collapsed. All the, all the big oligarchs went to the Kremlin and said, hang on a minute, we're bankrupt, bail us out. And, and, and um, they put their hands in the, in the um, state's coffers and, um, and stuffed their pockets. Now, basically, that's what the banks have done. Um, and, um, uh, and I think there's a huge popular anger about that. Uh, I think that if it happens again, and I think there is a risk, it could happen again, uh, very seriously. And, and, and if we go through an Iceland-style collapse, and you, you know, go to Iceland, see, you know, I, Icelandic people are Nordic, they're Scandinavian, they don't get angry about many things, and they are absolutely furious, and they're right to be. Um, and in those kind of circumstances, the the political, we 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 expected. Um, all sorts of political turmoil as a result of this crisis, and so far we've seen remarkably little. But I think that it's tempting fate to think that if we have another crisis, that, that there will not be um, severe political consequences, and, 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 and who knows what could happen. That, that's what happened in the 1930s. We had the rise of fascist parties, and we had a war. I'm not saying that's, you know, that's likely, but, it's, but, you know, but we should be aware of the risks of, 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 of what we're doing. So let me make three announcements before we First, uh, let me just remind you of the sponsors of the event, which I, which I pronounce them properly before. Uh, Lex, which is a specialty procedure of the OBAC, which is sponsoring the event. I really encourage you to check it out because uh, probably it's uh, probably one of the best places um, where people have data what's happening in Europe. Uh, the OBAC is at LSE. And finally, APCO Worldwide Perspective on Europe. Um, would be uh, the, the first sponsor. Then, um, remind you as well that outside uh, there is someone selling goods. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we are welcome to buy them. Uh, but it, they will be signed in a reception that will take place. You get a free drink as well. Yeah. I will get a free drink. There is a reception in the eighth floor of the new academic building. It's the, 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 uh, the top building, the top floor, sorry. Uh, so, uh, I am more than welcome to, to, to join us, but not. Before uh, thanking the presenter again for uh, his presentation, I'm 